everyone welcome to or welcome back to my channel or should I say welcome back to myself I'm sorry I've been so AWOL lately on this channel however I am back and everything should be to a normal uploading schedule however in the last video in the comments someone suggested a case and thank you for all your suggestions in the comments as well as via email I do see them but the case that was suggested is a very interesting case and also when this case was suggested I was actually going on holiday to the area that it was suggested but the point is today's case is incredibly disturbing because what this person did to the person that they supposedly loved is just unbelievable and how someone could even think about doing this to the person that they love but today we're going to talk about the SWAT Corp butcher and with that being said let's get into today's case intended for mature audiences only today we are heading to a place called SWAT Corp Munt which is a city in Namibia it is 325 kilometers from the capital of Windhoek and is mostly known for its beaches and German colonial architecture. It was founded in 1892 as a harbor for German ships mostly. Living in Swakopmund was a couple named Monica and Thomas Florin, or Florin. During the time of the incident, Monica was 30 years old and Thomas was 32. Monica had German heritage and spoke English, Afrikaans and German and her husband, Thomas, was a German citizen who moved to South Africa on a working visa. Monica and Thomas had two children, and they were five and two years old at the time. So Monica and Thomas's relationship was quite rocky from the start, and I'm not saying this is the only reason, but Thomas Florin was one of the biggest and loudest guys in the room. He always knew everything, so if someone said to him that the sky is blue, Thomas would give the exact reason why the sky is blue, and he knew a guy who knew the guy about the sky kind of thing. But Thomas was apparently all talk and no action. And he was also believed by himself to be a jack of all trades. But even though Thomas had all these apparent skills, he wouldn't really be able to ever hold down a permanent job. He had jobs, but he would often either leave the job or he would get fired from them. So there was a lot of pressure on Monica to provide for her two kids and Thomas as well. And eventually Monica had just had enough. She was tired of treating Thomas like one of the children as well. And remember, Thomas was there on a work visa. So when Thomas wasn't working, his visa was technically not involved. So the Namibian government was now knocking on the door being like come on you got to get work or you got to get out of here you can't just sit here. So now there was not only drama about Thomas not having a job Monica having to provide all the money and everything for the home but also Thomas's visa was now being threatened to be taken away and he was now going to have to be shipped back to Germany. But not only was Thomas now potentially having to leave the country but also Thomas was threatening Monica to take the children with him if she didn't come with. So yeah, there was some real nasty domestic disputes happening behind closed doors here. But as a side note with regards to the jobs that Thomas did have, he was apparently reported to be a firefighter at one point, a handyman or a carpenter at another point, and then his last job before the incident occurred, he was a chef. So things were now getting really rocky between Monica and Thomas. They were fighting constantly, and there was this constant threat and nagging that Thomas might have to leave soon. And this took a whole year back and forth of the couple fighting, threatening each other, threatening to leave, sleeping in different beds, all that. But eventually the couple decided, Thomas and Monica, that they will stay in the same home for the sake of the children, but they're going to stay in separate beds and they're basically going to live their own separate lives. And by January of 1998, Monica had actually started dating another man and also another German man. So Monica was done. She had checked out mentally and she was no longer interested in Thomas as a romantic partner. But yes, they were still technically married. But also the reports that I read about Monica and Thomas, I'm not sure if Monica's boyfriend was an affair or if it was an actual known boyfriend by both Thomas and Monica, obviously. But this is unclear because at one point, Monica and her new boyfriend were walking around the town and Swakopmund is quite small. It's not a very big town. So people knew who Monica was and they saw her with this other man and word got back to Thomas and apparently then Thomas raged and I'm not sure if it was because he really didn't know about Monica's infidelity at this point or if he was just really embarrassed that she was out and about with another man and now this is all coming back to him and now pressures on him to be like the man. But what Thomas did in retaliation to Monica walking around with her new boyfriend in town was that Thomas followed Monica's new boyfriend all the way to work and then and he stormed into the doors at work he went to his office or cubicle and 
they then started shouting, ranting and raving at the new boyfriend. And obviously this is incredibly embarrassing, not only for Monica, Thomas and the new boyfriend, but this is now this guy's reputation in town. And you know gossip travels really fast. But Monica's boyfriend did tell Monica about this whole incident at work and there was now another heated argument in the Florin home that night as well. But this just really cemented to Monica that she's done. She's done with the marriage, she's done with Thomas and she just wants him out basically. But time is ticking and Thomas's work visa is knocking on the door that he's got to ship out. So Thomas is now begging Monica, please come with me to Germany, please. We've got to take the kids. I can't stay here anymore. I can't hold a job down here in Namibia. And Monica's not interested. She has her kids. She has a house. She has a job. She has a boyfriend. She doesn't want to go anywhere. She doesn't need Thomas anymore. So then on the 23rd of May, 1998, Thomas takes the car and heads to Vintuk, where he then talks to authorities, gets his papers in order, ready to leave for Germany. And then Thomas books three tickets to Germany. And none of these tickets were for Monica. The flights were set for early June. So if you live in South Africa, you know the pain of home affairs. But secondly, there is something called the unabridged birth certificate that kids have to have, especially when traveling. And both parents are listed on this unabridged so that when they travel, they know that this parent isn't just taking the child to another country to threaten some kind Kind of domestic fight and to kind of have one up on the other partner and it's also I think for kidnapping and stuff like that so it's a very important document and I think most kids need to have it when traveling but the same can be said for Namibia as well I'm not sure if they have an unabridged birth certificate but you do need a letter from both parents or the other parent who is not with the traveling parent that they authorize the traveling parent to take the children. But Thomas knew that he was not gonna get this from Monica because he was taking the children without Monica's knowledge, or he was at least trying to. So there was clearly an issue here and an obstacle that Thomas knew that he had to get over in order to get his children to Germany with him. So now we fast forward to early June in 1998 and Monica's best friend and neighbor tried to call her. They tried to call the house phone the whole time and no one was answering. She saw that Monica's car was in the driveway, but Monica wasn't there. Important note. So then Monica's best friend who lived next door went up to Monica's house and she's knocking on the door and then Thomas opens and she can see that the two children are inside. So Monica's best friend is in standing there and she's talking to Thomas and Thomas seems absolutely frantic. He's constantly trying to look for things while he's talking to Monica's best friend. He then eventually ushers her inside while he's still trying to look for things. And he's like, Monica took everything. She left for Cape Town and I have nothing here for myself. But when Monica's best friend is looking around in the house, she sees everything as normal, except for the furniture is gone and big things are gone. But she knew that these things were gone because Thomas had packed them into one of those big crates that go on the shipping cargo things. Words are completely escaping me today, but you know what I'm talking about. So Thomas had already packed these things months ago in order to prepare for his move to Germany. So she knew that these things were gone. But Thomas is saying that he's looking for certain things and that Monica left for Cape Town to be with her new boyfriend. But Monica's best friend also knew that she was apparently still dating this German guy who lived in Namibia at the time. And she really believed that Monica would have told her if she was dating someone new as well. But also what stood out to Monica's best friend when she was visiting this house was that there was a massive pot on the stove and it was boiling and there was this big chunk of meat inside the pot. And Monica's friend just remembered that it was such an odd smell, but she thought that maybe he was just pre-cooking everything because he didn't really have much storage left in the house, but she thought that maybe he was just making do. And because Monica's best friend was still hovering in the house, she's kind of like looking around at everything, having a sneak peek. Thomas eventually said to her, do you know, do you want to stay for supper? Like, what is it? And she said, oh, cool, she'll stay for supper. So the four of them then ate, Monica's best friend, Thomas and the two kids, they all ate. And then eventually Monica's best friend needed to use the toilet. So she gets up and she then go heads to the main bathroom, the family bathroom, and she sees Monica's shoes in there, her makeup, her toothbrush, her hairbrush, and everything there that she would use on a daily basis. And she took a step back and she thought, wait, didn't you just say that she left to Cape Town and took everything? So why is everything of hers here? Even the pair of shoes that she wore almost every day were near the bathroom door when she went there and she thought that this was very strange. 
And this was something that really sunk into Monica's best friend's gut. And she was like, something's not right here. So she had her niceties and she said, thank you to Thomas. Thank you to the children. She is still concerned about Monica's whereabouts, but she leaves and she says, oh no, everything's fine. It's fine. But as soon as she heads home, she then calls the police. She tells her husband and she tells the police that they need to at least try and do some sort of welfare check or something to see if they can find if there's any evidence in the home about where Monica could be. So police head to the home home on the 5th of June 1998 and they having a look around they see nothing so they're kind of almost heading out of the door when they notice that Thomas has a ticket for, for that cargo ship box. I really cannot remember that word it has gone from my mind and I know when I edit this it is going to irritate me that it's right there but anyway so they find the receipt for this container there's the word and the police thought that this was a bit suspicious and they know that this container is now headed germany bound in a couple of days so they go with their guts they fall on this hunch and they then go to thomas florin's container and inside the container at first when they open the doors they find that there's a lot of furniture cupboards bedding all that kind of stuff and also clothes but when they look at the back of the container they find live tortoises at least 10 of them they also find skins of lions, leopards, all endangered and indigenous animals. And this is highly illegal. Not only is he now trying to transport live animals across the sea to another country, but also he has these indigenous skins or these endangered skins that is also incredibly illegal and very frustrating. So the police may not have anything about Monica's disappearance, but they hauled Thomas Florence straight into prison for trying to poach these animals. But now, while Thomas is in jail, sorting out this whole endangered animal debacle about him trying to export them to another country, Monica's best friend, remember her neighbor who lives next door, illegally, mind you, asks her husband to go over to the house next door because she says something is not right. Something is irritating her that she has to go into that home. She knows that Monica just won't leave and she doesn't feel like the police did a good enough job. So illegally, her husband then heads over, goes through the fence, opens the door. I'm not sure if he had a key because I'm not sure how else he got into the house, but he opens the door and he has a look through everywhere. He then calls over for his wife and his wife also comes into the house, Monica's best friend. So they now both having a look in the house. They're looking through the bathroom. They're looking through the bedroom, but then they notice the roof. And if you know what I'm talking about, in some South African homes, they have like this hole in the roof where you push the false ceiling through and you can climb into the roof. It's like an attic almost, but it doesn't have like one of those pull down ladder things. You have to get your own ladder. The couple then get a ladder, they push the false ceiling away, and now they're having a look inside the roof. And they're shining a torch everywhere, and then they notice that in the corner of the roof, right at the back, is a massive red bucket. So they go closer, they have a look, and before they can even get to this bucket, Monica's best friend's husband notices a skull right there in the roof so they just step back they're not interested they go down the ladder and they call the police the police then come they have a look through the roof and in that red bucket that we were talking about was a human torso that looks like it had been cooked in an oven or baked somehow because it wasn't burnt it was crispy Yes, they also found the skeleton and when they had a proper look, they found some more skeletal remains. But when they also had a look at the bones that looked like arms or femur bones, they looked like they still had meat on them, which looked like they had been cut and also that they had been boiled. Next to the red bucket, they also found a long black hammer, which kind of looked like a mallet or a hammer kind of thing. But when the police left the roof, they walked down the ladder, they took a look around the place. And the reason why they left so quickly was because they thought that the place was absolutely spotless. And then when they actually thought about it, they were like, wait, Thomas Florin has two children, both under the age of six, one's five, one's two. The place is absolutely spotless. Not any dirt, not any cookie crumbs, not any sweet papers, not any children's marks on glass, nothing. And I mean, I don't have any children, but I assume that having an absolutely spotless house with a two-year-old and a five-year-old must be pretty impressive, or at least a lot of work constantly. So the police go on their hunch again, and then they decide to spray luminol all over the house. They didn't really find much in the kitchen besides on the counter, which they thought is probably a place where blood most likely would be. But then they went in into the bathroom and then they also went into the bedroom and these two places lit up like a Christmas tree. In the bathroom on the one side down the bath was just blood everywhere on the curtain on the wall leading off the floor of the bath onto the tiles it was everywhere. 
In the bedroom, there was a bloody footprint as you entered the door. There was also blood on the sheets, on the pillars of the bed. It was everywhere. So Thomas Florin now was officially charged with murder. But when Thomas heard this, he was like, it wasn't him. He did nothing. She went to Cape Town to be with her lover. It had nothing to do with me. But he was charged and he was told that he was going to trial because he pleaded not guilty. And when the trial started in Vintook High Court, he remained quiet. He pleaded the fifth for the entire trial. Now Thomas's defense lawyers really pushed to say that there was no proof that the blood in the bath was human blood because actually in all these articles that I read I couldn't really find proof or evidence that Namibian police ever released that the blood was proven to be human but also if you did hunt a deer which is likely as possible and you brought it into the bathroom to then skin it I don't know what happens but something like that I don't understand why there would be blood in the bedroom and on the sheets I mean we're not judging here but I don't think that you would bring an, an, an animal carcass into your bed but also even if the defense was trying to prove that the blood was animal or whatever type of blood it is and that wasn't human how does Thomas explain the human torso the human skull the human bones in his roof and also remember Monica's best friend remembered that massive pot boiling so was it Monica that was boiling in that pot however the prosecution really believed that they had a strong case and that Thomas Florin premeditated Monica's death because remember when he was talking to the Namibian authorities about going back to Germany when he was in Vintuk he booked three tickets months before this all took place so did he know that Monica wasn't going to come on the plane? Did he maybe think that he could eventually persuade her? Or did he know exactly what he was going to do before he left? But then the court found that what most likely happened was that Thomas was said to have killed his wife on the 2nd or 3rd of June 1998 in the couple's house in Swakopmund. And he killed her with at least two blows to the head with a very blunt object. He then dismembered her body, cooked parts of it and hid the remains in the attic but Thomas would always deny this fact. Then, on the 22nd of December, 1999, Thomas Florin was found guilty in the Vintuk High Court. He was then dubbed the Swakopmund Butcher, and he was sentenced to life in prison, plus three months for the illegal smuggling of live animals, as well as their skins. But then, in 2016, he was granted parole, and will be eligible for parole next year in 2024. Monica's children are living with Thomas's parents in Germany. So quite the hectic case and if we take a step back yes there was blood in the bath that may not have been human. I'm not sure about the articles that were there but Thomas still can't explain the human torso and skull and body parts that were found in the attic or the roof. But let me know what you think of this case down below. I hope you're all staying very well. Thank you for always being there and being so kind. I really do appreciate it and I'll see you again next week. Bye.